Oh crap, I can't believe it's been like half a year since the last time I talked about a video game. <laughs> Correction, it's been at least eight months since the last time you talked about one. Gee, thanks. That makes me feel a lot better. Only, it doesn't. Dog, I don't understand why you're so hung up on trying to do another one anyways. Couldn't you just make another shenanigans video or something and just call it a day? No, I can't. Don't you see? If I don't make another one soon, I'll start to lose the plot. Don't tell me I spruced up the channel for nothing. What are you talking about? What plot? Ugh, never mind. Just help me pick something to talk about. What about that thing you hinted at a while ago? Huh? What thing? You know. That thing. Good. That's exactly what I hoped you'd say. Oh shit. Oh yeah! Tekken 1. No, 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 dog. I was talking about the movie. Ah, Tekken. One of the best-selling fighting game franchises of all time. Created in 1994 by Namco, Tekken was one of the first fighting games to burst out on the arcade scene to be in 3D, competing with Sega's own 3D fighter, Virtua Fighter. Fast forward to today, and Tekken is still dominating the 3D fighting game market, with the only visible competition being Namco's other fighter, Soul Calibur 6. Oh yeah, and uh, Dead on Arrival 6, if you catch my credit card! That shit is egregious. <laughs> Having games across four generations of consoles and three generations of handhelds, spanning almost 25 years, it's clear that Tekken has become a household name in the pantheon of fighting games. For those of you who don't know, I'm a huge Tekken mark, as many of the longtime viewers here are well aware of. And trust me, it's been a long time. As far back as 2011, I have been posting Tekken-related content on this channel on the regular. From random online matches and customization videos, to funny highlights and stupid little skits in regards to the series, I had a bunch of content dedicated to Tekken, and still do in fact, just not so often as I used to. It's not that I don't like the series anymore, I'm still enjoying Tekken 7 a whole lot, I'm just not posting Tekken stuff exclusively as much anymore because I want to branch out to more other things I like, such as other fighters and other games in general. Moreover, I want to branch out and start talking about games, which is the case for this video, if you haven't noticed already. Hey everyone, I'm Bento, and I'm sure you've all already met my associate over here. Howdy! And that's right folks, today we'll be talking about the first game in the Legendary series that started it all, Tekken. Originally called Rave War during its development, Tekken was one of the first fighting games to feature 3D character models as mentioned before, hitting Japanese arcades on December 9th of 1994, with it coming to the rest of the world just two days later. It wasn't until March of next year when Tekken would make the jump to consoles in Japan, and then later that November in Europe and North America. It was ported to the Sony PlayStation, as the arcade version of the game was developed for Namco's System 11 arcade board, which was based off of the PlayStation already. So it was only natural for the game to be ported to that system when it was practically built for it from the very beginning. And that's the exact same version of the game we'll be looking at today. Unfortunately, however, just like Dragon Ball GT Final Bout before, I don't have the manual for this game. But it's not because I threw it away or anything like that. It's because the guy before me threw it away. God damn it, used section of the GameStop I went to 15 plus years ago. By the way, I won't be going into anything too deep in this video, like frame data or anything like that. Mostly to keep things as simple as possible for any new viewers out there, but also because I don't think I can do that kind of info any justice, especially in a kind of video like this. You get me? I won't be going over any of that fancy ass FGC tech in this video. This is strictly a review vi- I mean, um, video where I talk about the game in a general sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this video won't have any of that Calculus 4 shit in it for a 24-year-old game. So you're not gonna calculate how many pixels long Paul's haircut is, are you?
let's let's just get this shit started. Uh, is this a fighting game? Uh, I I've played fighting game before, and while this is a game, uh, it, it's not. This is not a fighting. Oh, my bad. You have to push start to Tekken. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Although they give you an option to skip it, as it says right there, you can actually play Galaga all the way through before actually loading up Tekken if you actually wanted to. That's pretty neat, having the ability to play a game while waiting for another game to load. I wonder why games don't do this more often. Namco had a patent on that shit. Mm. Oh, it expired in 2015. Well, that's good. Too bad it didn't expire in 2006. Could have used that kind of tech on that Sonic game. Not that it would make that game any better though. It's no use! Anyways, after that little distraction, you're met with the game's opening, featuring all the characters that are included in the roster. I gotta say that these types of PS1 FMV sequences don't age particularly well, especially when it's all 3D like this. You can practically see body parts clipping through clothing and other body parts and vice versa. Well, even so, it was actually quite impressive for the time. They were considered almost movie-like, so seeing a cutscene of this quality in a game like this would have been mind-blowing at the time. Upon the cinematic finishing, if you don't press anything, the game automatically goes into attract mode, which is basically where the game just shows random pre-recorded demonstrations of itself that is typical of arcade machines when they weren't being played. The purpose of these is to, well, uh, attract people passing by the game, in hopes to make them want to play it. I don't know why the console ports of these games feel the need to have them, but it's always really neat to see them. Pressing start, you're greeted with the game's menu. You got your standard modes here, uh, arcade, 2P play, and uh, uh, test mode. Oh, that's just options mode, okay, okay. Here you can change things about the game, like the difficulty of the AI, number of fights in a round, and how long a round should be. You can even change the type of background music to either the original arcade version themes, or the remixed arranged console version of those themes. Pretty cool feature, I must say. There's also a record section where you can take a look at the stuff like time rankings of arcade mode, how many fights you won in two player verses, and which characters are used more often than others. These also show up in the attract mode in a much more visually appealing manner, by the way. And of course you got memory card where you can save or load your game. And in something as old as Tekken 1 is, you have to remember to actually go to this menu and save it manually, because autosaving was pretty much non-existent at this point in time. So that just leaves arcade mode and 2P play mode. 2P play mode is just versus mode, you need at least two people for that, and last time I checked, I'm a singular person, so I can't do that right now. I'm here! Shut up! Now with that out of the way, all that's left is just arcade mode. And in here, it's exactly what you'd expect from an arcade mode. You pick a character, fight some scrubs, then you fight the boss. Pretty straightforward. And while the story is often not the main focus of these type of games, as if there's any to begin with, the great thing about fighters is that the arcade mode can double up as the story mode, per se. After beating the final boss, usually you get a bit of text and a picture or two of what the character that you played as did after winning, like an ending of sorts. As I will discuss later, this is no exception for Tekken, as you are compensated with a little something after beating the final boss of the arcade mode, featuring your character. A little cool incentive to get you to play as everyone, to say the least. The only problem now is to figure out which character to start with. Looking at all these faces, they look pretty serious. So who do we got here? Well, being the Tekken fan I am, I'd gladly tell you. But before we get to know who they are, we must first find out why they are. Of course half this shit is retconned by the future title of Tekken 7, but let's not talk about that right now, so yeah. In this world, the strongest fighters from all corners of the globe have gathered to participate in the Tekken, a fighting tournament organized by none other than the head of the mega corporation, the Mishima Zaibatsu himself, Heihachi Mishima. With the prize being a large sum of money from the Mishima fortune, each fighter present has come to the tournament for one reason or another. Some fight for the fame of being the toughest fighter in the planet, others fight for the fortune and grandeur that comes along with it. And then there's others who just want to fucking kill. Mishima! This is payback! It's that girl. Oh, try me, bitch. 
The more accurate details of the story and plot are actually in the manual for the game. I always really did like when the manual for the game had some lore stuff in them. Too bad I don't fucking have it. Thanks, guy who sold it at GameStop 15 plus years ago. Okay, so you got eight characters that you can play around with right from the get-go. We got the Terminator, a no theater performer, Tiger Mask, Amazon Prime, Bruce Ploitation, No Shoes No Service, Not Benny Maru, and last but not least, Vegeta. You can also unlock more characters as you play the game, with the total number of fighters being a little bit more than doubling the amount of the original eight. So that'll be about um uh, eight plus eight plus one. Seventeen, seventeen fighters, yeah, okay. For anyone who's in the know, this starting roster is not at all bad. All of, if not most of these characters, are mainstays in the Tekken series, with a version of them showing up in all the future installments to come. These are the characters that most people will recall when they think of Tekken, or at least until Tekken 3. These guys are pretty much borderline iconic. I guess I'll just go with Vegeta for now. Apparently he's the main character of the game, and just so happens to be Heihachi's son. You can tell that he's angry at him because of those vicious looking eyebrows that got passed down the bloodline. Oh yeah, and also because of the scar that he got back in grade school when Heiachi threw him off the cliff because he wanted to see if he was strong or some shit. If you're truly my son, then you'll be able to climb back up. <laughs> Anyways, now with that out of the way, let's get on with the most important part. That's right, after all that preamble just talking about the game, it's finally time to talk about the game. Once you pick your character and get into an actual game, it's presented like so. You got your standard UI for a fighting game, there's a health bar for each character in the match, the time left in the particular round, the number of rounds won or that are needed to win, below the health bars close to the corner of the screen, shows the character's names. One interesting thing about the UI is that the colors of the names change depending on what outfit the characters are wearing. Blue for the default costume, and red for the alternate. That's a nice touch. Another interesting thing about the UI that I haven't really seen in any other fighting game, at least to my knowledge, is that there's an indicator for the location of the stage that the fight is taking place on. That's pretty damn cool, as most of, if not all the stages are based off of real life places such as Japan's Kyoto, the Acropolis of Athens from Greece, and Monument Valley from the States. Heck, they even got a friggin' baseball stadium in here! A baseball stadium! Baseball... Stadium! Oh! That's a baseball! There's a total of 11 stages in the game, with each one played on an infinite field, with no invisible wall on either end of the arena. The 2D backgrounds that accompany them are actually quite detailed and vibrant, fitting very well and properly being representative of the location they're trying to emulate. Additionally, they scroll accordingly as you move around the stage, with different camera angles showing a different part of that background that was previously out of view. It's as if the 2D backgrounds are wrapped around the infinite field, kind of like a dome over a plateau or something like that. That way, it's as if you're actually on an island located on Lake Windermere, beating the shit out of an assassin who has a distaste for shoes. Also, I'd like to point out that there's a button that you can press during the first couple seconds of a round to change the angle of perspective of the camera. I mean, it's a neat feature, but like, I don't know why you would want to play it in any other angle except the default. Cool for parties, not cool for stretching your fucking neck just to see shit. Speaking already on the presentation, might I add that the music in this game is truly something else. I don't know much about your average fighting game music. But this is definitely not your average fighting game music. It's got this sort of mix between electronica and actual instruments that I can't quite understand, but I can still recognize it as having a straight, techno-ish kind of house music-y vibe, if you know what I mean. In fact, if we were in the club, and a track from this game came on, and you told me that it was an underground lo-fi techno track, I actually would have probably bought it. And I find it phenomenal that the music in Tekken is the way that it is, because despite it sounding like that, all the tracks fit really well with the stages that they're associated with. Fiji and its tropical sounding beats, Sushuan and the inclusion of some traditional Chinese instruments, and Monument Valley just creating this dark foreboding atmosphere with an ominous orchestral backing. These tracks bring life to the stages, and is really high up there in terms of how good the soundtrack is for a fighting game, especially at the time. 
This goes for both the arcade version and PlayStation versions of the tracks. I think I mentioned this before, but because you have the option to switch types of music at the options menu, instead of having just one track per stage, you get two tracks per stage. Personally, I like to flip flop between the two versions of each stage because they are all great in their own ways. The remix PlayStation version of the tracks being more high quality and having more traditional instruments thrown into the mix, and the classic arcade version for having that sick ass Chicago track. Anyways, onto the actual gameplay. The basic movement is pretty much as you'd expect from any other fighter, though it feels a bit faster than the norm. You can walk forward and backwards with the left and right directional buttons, depending on which side of the screen you're on. The jump and crouch buttons are mapped to the up and down directional buttons respectively. You can also dash backwards and forwards by double tapping the direction you want to go in. And if you're from a far enough distance, you can press them three times and you can run. And of course, you can block attacks by holding backwards, as well as blocking low attacks by crouching and holding backwards at the same time. The great thing about being a 3D fighter is the ability to move away and towards the background to dodge attacks by sidestepping. Unfortunately, being an early Tekken title, this game doesn't have sidestepping. Fortunately, however, everybody in this game has, like, trampolines for shoes, so you can avoid all attacks by jumping in the air and staying in the air for a period of time. Speaking of attacking, you'd think that would be the same as the other fighting games, right? You have a punch button, you have a kick button, and a demonstration. Well, I mean, you're not wrong, but... I don't think that there's anything of note, even to this day, that even comes close to how Tekken plays. As mentioned literally seconds ago, most fighting games have a dedicated button for punching and another button dedicated for kicking, with most even breaking it down to punches and kicks that vary on strength level, such as light punch and heavy kick. The thing about Tekken is that instead of having those different strengths of punches and kicks mapped to each button, a different limb is mapped to them. Square and triangle buttons are for the arms, and X and circle are for the legs, with the left button of the two pairs being mapped to the left limbs, and the right button of the pair being mapped to the right limbs. Though just like in other fighting games, pressing a combination of directional and attack buttons grants you access to special moves. Most moves require only one direction and a button, but there are a few that require multiple directions and a button as well, in the same vein as motion inputs from the usual fighter, such as the trademark Mishima Wind God Fist, and Paul's... <laughs> Coupled together with the move that launches the opponent in the air, and you got yourself a certified combo. You get him in the air somehow, you link a few moves or two, and rinse and repeat. You can also link normals into normals too. Almost all the characters can link a left punch to a right punch, while only some can link a left punch to a right kick. It all just depends on if the character you're playing as has it in the moveset or not. In any case, after you deck the other guy in the schnoz real good, They'll eventually drop to the ground like a ton of bricks, and unlike most 2D fighters where you can't hit them while they're on the floor, in this game, you can. Once your opponent hits the ground, you got an ample amount of time to follow up with literally a virtual fighter jump attack, or almost any other attack, as long as it hits low. Speaking of low attacks, just like in other fighters, attacks vary on the different areas of the body. Highs near the head, mids around the torso area, and lows for the J's on their feet. Of course, you can always block highs and mids by holding back and standing, and block lows by holding back and down while in crouch. I touched on this earlier when talking about how everyone has trampoline shoes, but there are other defensive options you can do as well. To avoid high attacks, you can press down and go into crouching position before the attack hits you, and you can avoid lows by simply jumping over them in time. You can also try backdashing away from your opponent to avoid the attacks, though this can be used in an offensive manner as well where you could dash forward toward your opponent and then quickly back dash away from them to try to get them to throw out an attack and hit them back while they miss. This is called a whiff punish. The whiff was the missed attack that they threw out, and the punish is the attack that you did afterwards. In addition, if your opponent is doing a move that has a long wind up, and you can literally see that shit from a mile away, you can just do a faster attack and get a counter hit, which yields more damage than the attack normally would do when it's not a counter hit. Most of the time, counter hits will lead to new opportunities to deal even more damage, in the form of a stun, or even a launcher that gets your opponent floating in the air for a combo. If you wait too long to turn your defense into an offense, be careful though, because some characters have moves that can essentially break your guard and cause a stagger, guaranteeing a follow-up attack. When I recorded some gameplay for this, I couldn't believe Nina's short dash right kick, 
also known as a uh, forward forward circle. It leaves me in a block stun that takes me out of the block, and then she can do a get up kick for easy free damage. And apparently King's down forward left punch move is the dumbest move in the game. Because it's way better if you hit your opponent with this when they're blocking rather than when they actually get hit. The reason being, of course, is that it becomes a fucking launcher on block. Oh, block. You're dead. Other than that, you can get around someone's defense by throwing. Instead of pressing hard punch and forward to do it like in any other fighting game, like Street Fighter, in here you have to press the punch and kick buttons of the same side at the same time for a throw from that side, with each side having a different throw. For instance, pressing left punch and left kick will give you one throw, while pressing right punch and right kick will give you another throw. Unfortunately, the only way to avoid getting thrown is to crouch before they grab you. The count is high, so you can duck it and launch your counterattack plan from there. Later games allow you to break or tech these throws by pressing the punch button that is respective of the side that you're getting thrown from. For instance, if someone's pressing left punch and left kick to throw you, you have to press left punch to avoid getting thrown. But here we ain't got that. Oh, quick side note, if you somehow manage to get behind them to throw them, you can't really. After getting thrown or knocked to the ground, you got a few tools that can help you recover though. For the offensive side, you can do a get up standing kick by pressing a kick button while on the ground, and then also a get up crouching kick for lows. You can also do a kip up by pressing back on the d-pad and both kick buttons, as well as a rolling cross chop with forward and both punch buttons. For the defensive side, however, there's not much you can really do. The later games in the series introduced this thing called side rolling and quick tech rolling into the background and foreground to evade attacks while on the ground. But in this game you can either roll backwards, forwards, or just get up and just block. By the way, once you're lying on the ground for whatever reason, the game takes forever to register anything. As it seems like, for a second or two, it thinks that you're still in the air or something and doesn't read your inputs for a good while. Hence why the Virtua Fighter-esque ground pound follow-ups are actually pretty useful. Considering the technicality of, well, everything, I can understand that it can be a little daunting for someone when they just start playing for the first time. But don't worry, it's actually a lot easier than it sounds. While it feels a little odd at first, you get used to it pretty quickly, and the way that the game is played starts to make a lot more sense. A simple press of a button actually does something that almost anyone anywhere will understand what's going on, and will, more often than not, leave someone impressed by whatever they just did, without even knowing what the hell they just did. They press the buttons, it does the cool thing. Plain and simple system that makes it really fun to play right from the get-go. Additionally, almost every attack can link into another attack, so you can make up combos as you go. Sure, it probably won't be the most viable combo in terms of optimization, but for someone who just picked up the game, that shit will be godsend for them. Anyone pressing some random buttons will be impressed by whatever the hell they just did with the press of a few buttons. Someone using law and just tapping circle and X over and over again could be amazed at the triple kick combo they managed to pull off, while another using Kazuya could be proud of themselves by slightly jumping and doing the weird spinning tornado kick thing. And that feeling of satisfaction that comes with doing the cool moves is further amplified by the special effects, both visually and audibly. I'm sure that you've noticed by now by looking at the gameplay that every attack that connects, some cool visual effects come out in the form of hit sparks. If an attack hits someone who is blocking, a grey bluish mist appears from the part of the body that the attack intended to damage. But if the attack hits someone and they aren't blocking, a greenish kind of blood splatter puffs out from where it connected. And if the attack was a hard-hitting move, sometimes a special kind of hit spark specific only to the character that did the attack can come out. Coupled together with the sound effects of the attacks that match very well with them, and you get some bone-crunching slap-happy action that makes for an almost believable fight. <laughs> for a fighting game, of course. And from there, the world is your oyster. No, seriously, this is back when the pause menu was just a pause, and no menu, so you couldn't really look at any move list to practice. Not that this game has a practice mode either. The only way that you could find at least a handful of moves back in the day was to mash it out and figure it out, or just to take a look at the instructions manual for like three useful moves. But it's all good, because since the AI in the arcade mode isn't too bright and doesn't read your inputs too perfectly to counter you 100% of the time, you can just find and make up shit along the way, and they'll carry you all the way, if not most of the way through the run. So after you do that shit a couple of times and beat up like 7 people, 
You get to the sub-boss. Each character on the starting roster has a different sub-boss, and upon completing arcade mode with them, you unlock their specific sub-boss. In this case, since I'm Kazuya, I gotta beat up his adopted brother, Lee Chao Lan, who strangely sounds like him. And he also fights like Law for some reason, too. Huh. Well, actually, all the sub-bosses in this game are pretty much composites of one or two existing characters on the roster, with a few of them being more of a straight-up clone than others. Lee here happens to be a composite of Law and Paul, with the voice of Kazuya. Armor King, who was King's sub-boss, is a composite of King and Kazuya. And then Kunimitsu is just straight-up Yoshimitsu. No. Like, really. It's literally Yoshimitsu. Exact same moves, same voice. And they even got the same damn portrait in the character select screen. Kunimitsu's just fucking Yoshimitsu. Also, funny side note. Kunimitsu's portrayed as a male in this game. Yup, that badass red-haired chick from Tekken Tag 2 was a dude in the first game. Well, well, no, not really. Namco just copied and pasted Yoshimitsu and changed the character model a bit, leaving his voice in Kunimitsu, and having her model be kind of more masculine-esque than expected. Unless this is a poison situation, then I don't, I don't, I don't fucking know. Ask Namco or something. I don't know. Anyways, after making quick work of Lee, it's time for the final boss, the Big Cheese himself, the man, the myth, the guy who really needs to fire his hairstylist, Heihachi Mishima. And what do you know? This motherfucker is real. He's practically a mix of Paul with the <laughs> Kazuya with the <laughs> and Jack with the <laughs> Coupled with the fact that he can be crazy strong and that he's the only one who can actually move in the third dimension in this three-dimensional fighting game, he's truly a force to be reckoned with. How the hell am I supposed to defeat this god of a man? <laughs> Oh. I did it. Well, that wasn't really any different from how hard the sub-boss was, who was already just a smidgen more difficult than the other bozos before him. I guess that's why he threw Kazuya off that cliff back then, to avoid getting humiliated by him in his own tournament. And as I said before, you are compensated with a little something after beating arcade mode. A good old CG FMV cutscene featuring your character. Oh, glorious day. The irony. Damn, what goes around comes back around, dog. He dropped that son of a bitch like it was a sack of potatoes in that fucking gorge. Jesus. Uh, it's still the same quality as the intro FMVs. Didn't know what I was expecting, honestly. Only the fact that how everything has aged so much is even more apparent with these ending cutscenes, though. However, I can't really be mad about it. I mean, they were movie quality back then, so I guess that's fine. Also, did you like that music that played during his ending, though? Well, you better, because you get to listen to it seven more times. I like it. <laughs> yeah, all the characters have that song play during their endings. Every single one of them. Well, except for the bosses, because they don't get an ending, so there's that. Man. And I really wanted to see Lee's ending where he throws both Kazuya and Heiachi off of the cliff with this music playing in the background. Also, I'd like to add an addendum to the unlockables for this game. Aside from unlocking characters, you can unlock a costume. For Kazuya only though. If you beat all 8 stages from that Galaga minigame that plays when you boot up the game, you get a third outfit for Kazuya, where he's all purple, has even spikier hair, and is in a black speedo, uh, for some reason? Actually, this outfit is Devil Kazuya, 
Kazuya's cursed soul half that was awakened first within himself when he got thrown off that cliff as a kid. You know, kind of like a Super Saiyan form. Only... not. But since I suck at Galaga and at life, I couldn't unlock him. But what I did do was find a save file online and play him through there. And yeah, that's a Devil Kazuya alright. He looks kinda weird without the wings that he'd have later on in the series. Also, is it just me, or does he look like Star Platinum from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure for some reason? And there you have it. Tekken 1 on the PlayStation 1. A really early 3D fighting game that spawned the juggernaut of a series that we come to know today. When I say this game is early, I mean it's really early. Movement in this game is pretty much a faster version of a 2D fighter, since you can't move in or out of the background like in the later games. But even for a Tekken game, although the movement is 2D, it's still kind of slow. Though it does make up for it by having one of the most unique control systems I've ever played in a fighter, that makes it fun to play and figure out even after a continuous session. And its fighting system has been a staple of the series ever since then, along with the amazing music and stages, which are both also unique. In a, in a good way, of course. While this game is still far from the Tekken series that we come to know and love today, with its lack of game modes, gameplay close to that of a 2D fighter, and the absence of the Tekken sidesteps, it's still a milestone in fighting game history as one of the first notable 3D fighting games ever made. Definitely worth a look if you're interested. Well, that's all I have for you today, folks. Sorry about this video ending up being longer than the last one did. I know I said that after the last one, that I tried to cut these videos down a little bit shorter, like maybe around the 18 minute mark or so. But for some reason I think videos like these do need to take their time a bit, you know? Unless I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, I'm probably doing something wrong. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, please leave your thoughts and comments down below. Those types of things help me really improve on what I should do and what I shouldn't do for the, these types of videos, you know? Well, until then, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. Now, what should I talk about next?